京都ビデオ I'm going to assume some of my audience has at least heard of the anime Spy Family. Based off the Tatsuya Indo manga of the same name, Spy Family has become one of those anime that really exploded in the past few years. And while I think a lot of the initial hubbub has since calmed down, its overall quick penetration into anime culture is nothing to sneeze at. This could probably have something to do with its main premise. A spy, an assassin, and a psychic orphan, each with their own agenda, end up forming a found family to further said agenda, and they try not to let any of the other party find out who they really are. But along the way, a greater bond ends up forming between the three of them, and soon has them realizing that maybe their little family unit is more than just a matter of convenience. It's a comedy that's ripe with wholesome, heartwarming moments for the whole family, mixed in with some keen spy action to keep things spicy. For that reason, it's become one of the more accessible animes out there for noobs to the medium. Who wouldn't want to see the comic adventures of Anya, who is the most realistically stupidest six-year-old despite having the ability to read minds? <laughs> But what's interesting is that this whole concept of people from unconventional backgrounds taking in a young child and becoming unwitting parental figures isn't that novel a concept. Hell, it isn't even a novel concept in anime. Today's anime is an exploration of that concept. An exploration set in the final frontier. <laughs> In the near future of the year 4001, in a galaxy far, far away, an interstellar acting troupe of six aliens plot a course for their next gig. But just as they're about to head to the Great Kabuki Theater at the end of the universe, a spacecraft warps out of nowhere and crash lands on the nearby planet Anika. The extraterrestrial troop shuttled down to investigate and may be offered to call a tow truck. Sadly, the only people they can find are a deceased human couple and their surviving baby girl. <laughs> After the investigating officer refuses to even take the orphaned infant in to the nearest intergalactic foster home, the six aliens are now stuck with her. With familial duty thrust upon them, the acting troupe turned babysitter's club have no choice but to set up shop on Anika and raise this baby as if she were their own flesh and blood. Five years soon pass, and the baby soon blossoms into the inquisitive and playful young kindergartner named Corona who enjoys life on the alien planet with her far-out family. They are as follows. Mother, the giant fluffy rat creature who is the de facto leader of the bunch. She is Corona's mother. Father, the wide-eyed military robot whose stoic disposition is tempered by his overall peculiar nature. He is Corona's father. Oishi. Takun, the weird, scarily inhuman looking alien with a heart of gold. He is Corona's pet squirrel. <laughs> Belka, the elf like cat girl with amazing muscles befitting her megafauna status. She is the sheriff of Anika and Corona's primary protector. <laughs> Andy, the far more robotic robot with one eye and big legs who has a shrewd mind for business. He is Corona's primary provider. And rounding out the class is Parker, the oval-shaped cyclops alien with thin limbs and a quiet disposition. She doesn't do anything. Nineteen eighty eight Space Family Carvelson is a peculiar pick of the litter. At a time where the OVA market was flooded with stylish hyperviolence, racy, not technically pornography titles, and any other weirdness unfit for television broadcasts, here you have this adorable little comedy about a little girl being raised by strange aliens on a planet full of even stranger aliens. For this reason, I could probably surmise that being the reason why you don't see people chit chat about this property much. 
What little I could find about this anime suggests that it was not a success in the home video market, and the powers that be have forever left it at the draw of the orphanage for misfit franchises, let alone actually blossom into cult status during the land grab of OVA titles in 90s America. No sir, left in the dust. But now that there's more manga and anime out there centered around the wholesomeness of a weird found family, the question must be asked. Was Space Family Carlvinson ahead of the curve? And if it was, why did it fail? Call the whole family to gather around the TV, or computer, or tablet, or phone. This is Space Family Carvelson. <laughs> the origin of Space Family Carvelson comes to us from the mind of Yoshito Asari. Born on November 20th, 1962 in the Hokkaido Prefecture of Japan, Asari was of that generation of creators who grew up with the works of the old masters and he debuted amidst the growth of the subculture that we now know as the otaku generation. And like that generation, Asari was also an otaku and hung around those spheres of influence, drawing doujin comics and the like. His areas of interest were mostly based around science fiction, special effects, mecha, and cute girls, and that informed what he loved to draw. Asari made his debut proper in 1981 with the 24 page one shot gag manga Jupiter Picket Line in Weekly Shonen Sunday. From there, he continued to submit one shots to a diverse platter of magazines that range from Hobby Japan special effects magazine Spaceship to Amatori Asha's groundbreaking hentai magazine Lemon People. In 1984, he submitted another potential one-shot to the anthology magazine Petite Apple Pie, whose niche involves stories centered around cute little girls. And before you assume the worst, it was on the level. For a few years, it was the main haunt for creators like Hideo Azuma, Shinji Wada, and Yoshiki Takaya, whom you might know as the creator of the Giver series. Space Family Carlson ran for around 10 issues of Petite Apple Pie until February of 1985. Tokuma Shulton, Apple Pie's publisher, was noticing a significant decline in sales thanks to changing tastes in the otaku market, so they gave the option to certain creators with ongoing series to make the jump to one of their shonen magazines. Asari-san was one of those creators. The name Space Family Carl Vinson was theorized to have been derived from the USS Carl Vinson, an aircraft carrier that was active in the Sea of Japan around that time, named after Georgia Congressman Carl Vinson known as the father of the two ocean navy. This can inform us of Asari's creative process during Carvelson. Since he had to come up with gags on the fly every month, there's a good chance he used objects and things that surrounded him every day as fuel for his weird little world. He definitely used that process as a means to pay homage to some of his favorite creations in Carvelson. One such example being a secondary character who's an alien anthropomorphic dog character who has the ability to transform and disembowel himself into a truly monstrous form. And his name is... John Carpenter. Also around this time, Asari was really starting to make connections within the anime industry, and was even getting some gigs from those connections. He was in charge of the creature design for the regrettable Dirty Pair Project Eden movie, and later on in the 90s, he would be an assistant character designer for Neon Genesis Evangelion, designing three of the more memorable angel designs, Sakiel, Shamshell, and Zeruel. With these connections and a popular comic under his belt, an OVA was bound to happen. Being produced by the studio Dogokobo, their first production spearheaded by themselves, the anime would be directed by Kimio Yabuki. Yabuki was a veteran of the industry at that point, being one of the first animators to get his start at Toei back in the 60s, his most noteworthy credit being co-director for Toei's Puss in Boots movie, which he collaborated on with Hayao Miyazaki. Boy, I have been talking about that dude a lot this year and the screenplay would be done by Michiru Shimada, whose resume at the time included most of the Dr. Slump anime and associated films. So with that director and writer, it was almost guaranteed that the light, airy, and weird tone of the manga would easily transfer to the small screen. Now for the anime itself, it's an adaptation that carries on that light, airy, and weird tone of the manga. It's such a faithful adaptation in humor and overall tone that I almost struggle to even comment on it. Because, what more can I say? It's a faithful adaptation of a weird gag manga. But in the interest of extending this video's length, I will attempt to say more. Animation-wise, it's totally serviceable. Nothing too spectacular aside from some cuts at the beginning and some effects animation, but it doesn't need to be spectacular considering its overall nature. Who we really need to credit is animation director and character designer Masahiro Sekino, who not only did a great job transferring these characters to another medium, but also animating them in ways that utilize their designs in the funniest possible ways. Me. Me. 
credit also needs to be given to the art director, Satoshi Miura. His design for the world of Anika really does make it a peaceful world in spite of the weird aliens bouncing around. It resembles the pastoral countryside of Japan in all seasons, from the green fields to the autumn trees. This ties into the overall structure of the Carvelson OVA. It depicts a year in the life of the family as they try to raise Corona signing her up for kindergarten in the spring, attending a summer games festival in the summer, and Corona gathering mushrooms in the forest in autumn. It's probably the best way to present a gag manga as a 45 minute narrative because it actually feels like there is a story going on in progress when there really isn't. As for the characters themselves, screen time is a bit uneven among the troop. Andy and Parker are basically non-entities after the prologue, which makes sense for the latter at least. Takun is only really there to be the physical comedy guy, which also makes sense because his grotesque appearance really elevates his pratfalls. <laughs> and Belka is mostly there to look cute and cut the occasional feats of strength. Hey, this anime's got muscular catgirl megafauna. I've got no complaints. But as one-dimensional as some of these characters can be, you do kind of get to explore them in the anime's more heartwarming moments. Father, being an eccentric goofball, can come off as way more aloof than he actually is. Tesho Ginda's dulcet tone certainly assists in that perception. Corona. Inai. However, it's revealed pretty early on that he is much more perceptive of Corona's needs and wants than you would assume, and is willing to protect her at the drop of a hat. And then there's Mother, who, being the leader of the troop before all this mess, really takes to raising Corona like a mouse to cheese, so to speak. She's caring, wants what's best for her, basically the most mother of mothers mother is. But in the fall segment of the OVA, we see her scold Corona for coming home from school late, and that causes Corona to run away from home. As the whole family searches around the planet for her, Corona ends up on a spaceship who has received the signal the troop has been broadcasting for the past five years, telling that they have a missing girl ready to be picked up. The grandmotherly alien, assuming Corona has no family to go back to, offers her a nice place to live. But Corona ends up turning her down, because she already has a family, right here on this planet. And while Mother is glad to have her adopted daughter back, it's an experience that made her accept that Corona is not going to be around them forever. Space Family Carlton is funny, it looks good, and it lands the heartwarming wholesomeness without submerging into schmaltz. So why, pray tell, is this OVA a complete obscurity even among retro anime fans? When I say that the Space Family Carlton manga was a hit, I'm not just saying that because I assumed it had to have been to get an OVA in the first place. No, people love this thing and clearly assume that it was destined for something greater. Even two years before the OVA came out, the Carlton characters made a cameo in the Magical Girl anime, Magical Emmy, the Magical Star. Credit to fellow retro anintuber Kenny Lauderdale for finding that out. And there were also resin kits of the characters floating around, including one of Corona Chan and Father, which fetches a pretty penny these days. Most of all, Carlvinson had a long shelf life for a gag manga, running from 1984 to the year 2000 when it switched over to the Kodansha Seinen magazine monthly afternoon. And when it ended, it didn't technically end because multiple sources have listed it as on hiatus for 24 years. But hey, 16 years of being a gag manga is certainly nothing to sneeze at here. So why has a perfectly satisfactory OVA adaptation of it been left to wither? Well, I've got a couple of theories. One easy explanation I have is that the market was no longer there for it. This was clearly meant for an otaku market that were used to titles like Dream Hunter Realm and Leta and the like. No matter how dark things might get, it's usually granted by a brand of wholesome cuteness that was big at the time. But now, in the late 80s, otaku had an appetite for grittier works, and any bishoujo level cuteness followed less the Azuma path and more the Sonoda path. As popular as the manga was, otaku weren't going to spend their hard earned bucks on that when they could be saving up for the next Bubblegum Crisis episode. And like other failed OVAs, it never had a shot at a second life in the States. 
According to Fred Patton, one of the founders of the first anime clubs in the States, the Cartoon Fantasy Organization, Carlton's and fan subs came to America right when the club was falling apart due to the meddling of one Randall S. Stuckey. It never had a chance to latch into fan consciousness, thus causing distributors to pass it over in favor of titles they knew had that pull. Just a victim of poor timing on both sides of the Pacific. That is to say the anime itself is not free of blame. Some otaku, like fandom veteran Mike Tool, have said that while the anime isn't bad, it is completely lacking in substance. I can totally see that. It's much easier to watch something this light and fluffy when you don't have to pay money for it. And it also has some of the pitfalls of gag comedy anime where half the humor almost necessitates some knowledge of Japanese culture to actually get a joke. And even then, I don't see many knee slaps coming from a joke where the native aliens of Anika think kindergarten is just another name for Hostess Club. But also, for as much as the anime is willing to onboard new viewers with the main plot, it also operates under the assumption that you know who the secondary characters are. They don't really bother telling us their names or who they are, and that really robs them of some of their humor potential involving them. We don't get the full context for John Carpenter and why he's a walking gag, we don't get context for the Norio Wakamoto voice drifter alien, Ace, and we don't get the joke as to why Corona's kindergarten teacher looks the most suspiciously human out of all the aliens cast. So there you are, Space Family Carlson failed because, despite having a lot of the right tools, it still made mistakes that prevented it from being the best it could be. And even if they had fixed those issues, it always seemed to be destined to be a victim of bad luck in terms of release timing. But as we've seen with Spy Family, an audience exists for this kind of anime now, far more than it did when the manga was first released. And maybe there is a chance that Space Family Carlson could be rediscovered. Is it going to be groundbreaking? Hell no. Is it going to be funny all the way through? Hell no again. But it's ultimately a harmless little ditty of an anime, a light afternoon snack that you can enjoy at your own leisure. If you need something that looks unmistakably retro and maybe can make a smile creep across your face, then you can look no further than here. Face Family Carlson certainly doesn't deserve to be seen as an unappreciated masterpiece, but it does deserve a little better than what we've been giving it these past 35 years. Thank you all for watching. If you like this video or want to support this channel, please donate to my Patreon. Each dollar can give you early access to my videos as they come out, as well as keep the channel running a bit more smoothly. You can also subscribe to the channel, ring that bell for notifications, or just like this video. Either way, you'll be helping me out. That's all for now. See you for the next round of tapes.